Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Again, my name is Mia Stevens and I'm with the uh, academic team here at JUMP. And today we're going to talk about uh, tools and methods that are commonly used in uh, engineering statistics courses. So we'll see how to summarize and graph data in JUMP. We'll talk about statistical intervals and hypothesis tests. We'll see how to build a variety of different types of statistical models. We'll provide an overview of some of our tools that are built in for designing experiments and also analyzing experiments. We'll see a highlight of some of our quality tools. And before we get started, uh, I'd like to point out that most of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, there are a variety of resources that cover these topics in depth. Uh, and one of the most important resources is our help. So if I click on the help button, you'll see books. And books provides links to all of our documentation. So for summarizing and graphing data and statistical intervals, uh, the, the book Basic Analysis and Essential Graphing provide all of the background details and information. Uh, there's a book dedicated strictly to designing experiments. Uh, fitting linear models and specialized models uh, include topics uh, for uh, the linear and nonlinear modeling. And there are separate books for quality and process and also reliability and survival. We've also provided a number of other resources uh, on our academic community. So the quick link is jump.com slash teach, and I'll simply point these out quickly. So this is our academic page, and on the bottom of our academic page is links to a variety of different resources. So getting started videos, uh, academic webcasts, so you'll see a listing of additional webcasts that are coming uh, over the next month or so. And the learning library provides information on how do I do X in JUMP. So if you're just getting started with JUMP, you'll see that we provide guides that are broken down into a number of categories. If I click on the Design Experiments outline, this will open the outline, and you'll see that there are a variety of topics listed. So these guides, most of the guides have uh, short videos. These are one to three minute videos. These guides all provide enough information to get you started. So if you know you want to do a particular thing, uh, the guides and the videos are a really nice place to start. And let me take a step back for a moment. We do record all of our videos. So today's webinar uh, will be recorded and posted on our Jump Academic Community. So the link to our community is on our homepage, uh, Jump Academic Community. And if you go to the community and search for the word webinar, you'll see a listing. And there's a collection of recent academic webinars. And this webinar will be posted there. So you'll see that the webinars that we recorded this fall have all been posted. With that, I'll return to JUMP and go ahead and get started. So I'm using JUMP on a Mac. But if you're familiar with JUMP, you know that JUMP runs natively on both Mac and Windows. If you're brand new to JUMP, we recommend that you watch one of the Getting Started videos. Uh, so we'll start uh, with just how to summarize and graph data in JUMP. So most of the beginning introductory navigating um, features of JUMP, uh, if you're new to JUMP, uh, we recommend that you watch one of the earlier videos. So I'm going to launch a data set. Uh, I'm using a jump journal for this webinar. And a jump journal just allows me to easily navigate and provides an outline for what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to launch a data set from the sample data directory. And under help, you'll see that there's a sample data library. This contains something like 500 data sets. And you can also see an organization of this uh, data library under sample data. So I'll be using data sets uh, from the sample data library and this first data set, if you're looking for it, is under control chart. So these are some data um, on diameters of a part. And we've got information on the operator who ran the machine, uh, the machine number, uh, and the phase. So this could have been data collected during uh, an improvement project where we had two different phases, or something could have changed during these phases. And we're going to start by looking at tools in JUMP for summarizing and graphing these data. A nice starting point, uh, if, you, if you're given data and you really don't know much about the information or you just want a nice high-level summary of the data, uh, is to use the Columns Viewer. So under Columns, towards the bottom, is the option Columns Viewer. And the Columns Viewer allows you to select as many variables as you're interested in. 
And recall that we use this little red bar to indicate that day is coded as categorical data or nominal data. Blue indicates the diameter is coded as continuous. And green is used to indicate ordinal data. I'll click the button that says Show Quartiles, and then select Show Summary. And I'm going to click this Clear Select button uh, to deselect all of the variables. So this gives me a, a good high-level view of the data, the variables in my data set. So I can see that I've got 40 categories of days, so 40 days worth of information. And when we have categorical data, we'll see the number of categories under n categories. Where we have continuous data, like diameter, we'll see the minimum and the maximum and some basic statistics. And if you select the Show Quartiles option, you'll also see the median and the quartiles and interquartile range. So I like doing this any time I first start looking at data to give me a feel for the range uh, of the data, uh, to get a feel for the shape of the distribution, to try to get a sense for whether I'm missing values. Um, if we're missing values, you'll see a new column called N missing. Um, and also um, just a, just a high-level overview to get me familiar with the information that I have. So I know that I've got four operators, I've got three machines, and I've got two phases. So let me close this. Now, if I want to be able to look at summary information, but I'd also like to look at um, the distributions for the variables, I'll use Analyze and then Distribution. The way the Analyze menu is broken down is distribution is, look, is used to look at one variable at a time, univariate graphs and statistics. And as you hold your mouse over a menu, you see a description of features that are available from that menu item up here. So fit y by x, this allows us to look at the relationship between one variable and another variable. So from here, I can ask for a two-sample t-test in ANOVA, simple linear regression, logistic regression, cross taps and chi-square. Tabulate, this is our version of a pivot table. So if you'd like to produce numeric summaries of your data. Um, we've added a new feature in Jump 13. I'm using Jump 13 uh, for this webinar. Um, text Explorer, so if you're dealing with unstructured data. Um, a fit model is if I'm dealing with models where I've got multiple X's or multiple Y's. So let's start with distribution and we'll talk about some of the other menu items as we go along. The distribution is for univariate graphs and statistics. And the reason that the icons next to the variables is, are important is that they help jump decide the type of analysis that makes sense based on the variables that we've selected. So if I select all of the variables and click Y columns or click and drag, I can select the variables, and I'll click OK. And for categorical data, like day and operator, machine and phase, we get a bar chart and frequency distribution. If we don't like the look or the layout, Jump gives us a vertical layout. Under the red triangle, we can select the option Stack. So Stack converts this to a vertical layout. These little gray icons can be used to tuck things away. So I'm not overly interested in day at this point, so I'll simply tuck it away. Now, if you find that there are changes like that that you'd like to make every time you use Jump, under Jump or File on a Windows machine, you can set preferences. So you can customize the look and feel of Jump. So this is the distribution for uh, diameter, operator, machine, and phase. And on the side, we see that there are a number of summary statistics that are provided. So by default, for continuous data, we see the mean, the standard deviation, the standard error of the mean, and we also see the confidence interval for the mean. So this is a 95% confidence interval for the mean. If there are additional statistics that you'd like to display, under the red triangle next to summary statistics, select Customize Summary Statistics. And there's a full list of additional statistics that we can request. So I'll often turn on the option in missing. And if I'm dealing with data that are skewed, I might turn on one of the robust options. We can also change the alpha level for the confidence interval. So instead of having a 95% confidence interval, if I'd like to display a 90% confidence interval, I can simply change it here. And this will add these options for this analysis only. And again, if you'd like to change the default summary statistics that display every time you do analysis, you can go to Preferences and change the preferences for summary statistics. For continuous data, we also see quantiles. So I see the median and 
the first quartile and the third quartile, and I also see the range of values. For continuous data, we see a histogram, and I'll just move my mouse in the corner and make this a little bit bigger. And we see a box plot. And box plots are particularly useful for seeing the shape and the centering and the spread of our data. They also give us an indication of whether we've got potential outliers if, if our distribution is roughly symmetric. And if we're dealing with very, very large data sets, the information in a histogram can be a little bit difficult to interpret, so box plots give us another way of looking at the shape of our distribution. Within the box plot, we see some additional information. So this little diamond in the center of the box plot uh, is the mean. So the center of the diamond is the mean, and the tips of the diamond are the 95% confidence interval for the mean. Now, anywhere in JUMP where you need additional information, you may see something like this box plot and not be quite certain what you're looking at. I'd like to share with you two um, uh, built-in help features that help anytime you're in a platform where you're seeing something and you'd like some additional information. One of the features is that, and I'll, I'll just come over here to this confidence interval. If you click your mouse on top of a confidence interval or any statistic and hover around in a clockwise direction, you'll see uh, the definition of what you're looking at and some help interpreting the statistics. So we can see that this is the upper 95% mean, which is the upper end of a 95% confidence. A second form of help that you can get within any platform is this question mark. And if you're on a Windows machine and you don't see this toolbar across the top, simply click the Alt key and the menu will appear. So I'm gonna click on the question mark and if I want additional information, for example, on this box plot, I'll drop the question mark on the box plot. And this will launch the help. So here I can see the box plot, um, and I can see some definitions of the components of the box plot, and scroll down to see additional information. So anywhere within Jump, you can get additional information using hover help, or by simply using the question mark and clicking where you'd like additional information. So back to our output here, and I'll make this a little bit smaller so we can see everything again. For categorical data, we see a bar chart and frequency distribution. And a little bit about all of our tables. If you have a table of summary statistics or any statistical output, if you right click in that table, there are additional options. So you can change the look and feel of a table. You can also add additional statistics if they're available. Or you can make that table of statistics into a separate data table or combine data table if you're interested in all of the statistics. And for both of these um, types of graphs, so we've got a histogram, a box plot, and summary statistic for continuous, and a bar chart and frequency for categorical, you'll see that there are red triangles underneath, um, right next to the, uh, the variable name. So if I click on the red triangle, you'll see that there are a number of additional, additional options available, and we'll talk about these as we get going. So for now, let me close this. So we've seen so far columns viewer for looking at summary statistics for many variables at a time, distribution for looking at histograms and box plots, bar charts, and summary statistics for categorical or continuous data. What if I just like summary statistics? So if I just like numeric summary statistics and maybe I'd like to add additional uh, pieces of information, I'll use this option tabulate. And what tabulate gives me is a, a palette where I can drag and drop variables. So if I'm just interested in looking at the summary statistics, I can use this platform. So for example, diameter is the variable that I'm interested in, and I've got two drop zones. I can drop it in the drop zone for rows or in the drop zone for columns. And notice as I drag the variable on top of these zones, the zones have a blue border drawn. And the blue border indicates that I can let go here and jump will, will do something. Um, so if I'm if I'm analyzing data, the variable that I'm analyzing, I typically like to drop this in the drop zone for columns. So by default, I see the sum, but if I'd like to replace the sum with additional statistics, for example, the mean and the standard deviation, I'll drag those statistics and drop them right on top of the word sum, and the sum is replaced with these two statistics. So now I could break this down by, for example, operator to see if there are operator or operator differences. And the drop zone for rows is now a tiny little box, and I'll drop this right inside of that box. And now I see a summary for the different operators. So I can see that operator RMM on average was a little higher than the others, and had a variability that was a little higher. 
Now, I can also break this down by other variables. So, for example, if I'd like to break this down by operator and then machine, I'll drag machine right next to operator, and we see this little blue rectangle indicating that I can let go here. So this is the drop zone. This will summarize first by operator and then by machine. And if I click and drag machine to the front end of operator, then it will summarize by machine and then by operator. We can close the control panel when we're done. And again, there are additional options under the red triangle. So if we want to turn that control panel back on, we select show control panel. And we can also make this into a data table. To save our work, if we'd like to come back to this again later, under Save Script, are a number of options for saving the script or the JSL code to recreate this output later. So if I select Save Script to Data Table, it'll save a new option, and I'll just click OK here. It'll save a new option to my data table, and if I click on the green triangle next to this option, it'll regenerate the output exactly as I had it. All right. So that's Tabulate. Now, how do I how do I summarize the data graphically? Uh, if I'd like a really nice flexible platform for summarizing the data and producing graphics, I'll use the Graph Builder platform. And again, this is a tool that I use a lot when I'm first getting started with an analysis to get me more familiar with my data. So there are drop zones here. If I drag and drop diameter to the Y zone, I see a, a scatter plot, and I've got different zones where I can release variables. And I won't spend too much time on this. This is covered in depth in some of our other videos. But this is a nice way of looking at potential relationships between diameter and some of the variables. So if I drag operator, I can see a dot plot broken down by operator. And across the top are a variety of graph elements that I can add to this graph. So for example, if I click and drag on box plot, I can add box plots to this picture. If I click and drag on line, I can add lines to connect the means for the different box plots. And I can also break this down by other variables. So for example, I could break it down by machine, or I can group by machine, or add machine as an additional variable. So a very nice tool anytime you're going to build a model, uh, or uh, if you've already uh, run an experiment, you want to be able to look at the data first before you go in and analyze the data. It's a nice tool for getting familiar with the data before you take it further. All right, so let's, uh, let's keep going. and. Um, I will just briefly mention that if you want to be able to slice and dice your data by values of variables in the data set, there's a nice data filter option. And if you're doing an analysis where you've got a lot of data and you want to be able to switch out and, and look at different X's or different Y's, and you want to do this dynamically, uh, there's a tool called the column switcher that's really useful. So let's move now to talk about statistical intervals and hypothesis testing. So in jump, any time we want to deal with one variable at a time where we're, we know that we're going to uh, either, either construct confidence intervals or perform hypothesis tests, we use the distribution platform. When we're dealing, again, with two variables at a time, we use fit y by x. And fundamentally, for more than two variables that we want to be able to, to fit a linear model, we use fit model. And I'll come back to this in a few moments. So I'm going to open up this data cleansing. And this is some data, again, from our sample data directory. And what we're studying is um, coal particles in a tank. Uh, and uh, this is a situation where we're trying to explore pH and polymer, and we're trying to clean coal particles out of a tank. So the lower the value, the better. All right, so if I want to look at this one variable at a time, and we're, here we're going to focus on things like hypothesis tests and uh, statistical intervals. So we may be interested in a confidence interval to estimate the mean, a prediction interval or tolerance interval, so I'll quickly show you how to construct these. We may be interested in looking at different distributions. And we may also be interested in equivalence tests. So let's take a quick look at these. So for dealing with one variable at a time, or I know I'd like to perform statistical inference, I'll use analyze distribution. And here I'll simply focus on coal particles. Again, I'll stack the distribution. Now, we already see confidence interval for a mean in two different ways. So we see upper 95% mean and lower 95% mean. And we see it represented as a diamond in the box plot. The red triangle next to coal particles, if we like a different confidence interval, so for example, maybe we'd like a 90% confidence interval, this will produce a confidence interval for both the mean and also the standard deviation. Under the red triangle, if we'd like a different type of interval, 
So for example, a prediction interval, a prediction interval produces an interval that is likely to contain specified number of future samples with a certain confidence. So for example, if I'd like to produce a prediction interval that will contain the next 10 observations, the default is a two-sided interval. I'll click OK. Then we produce a prediction interval. So this is, this is an interval likely to contain the next 10 observations. And again, we see the mean and the standard deviation. Now another type of interval is a tolerance interval. And a tolerance interval is an interval that's likely to contain a specified proportion of future ob observations with a given confidence. So here we specify two values, the confidence and the proportion of future observations that we'd like the interval to cover. And this is commonly used in situations as an alternative to performing a capability study. So I'll click OK here, and jump produces a tolerance interval. So the way we interpret this is we're 95% certain that 90% of our future observations will be contained within this interval. So what about hypothesis testing? So for hypothesis testing, well, I might first want to look at the shape of the distribution. So I might ask for a normal quantile plot. And the normal quantile plot, if our data roughly follows a straight line and falls within the bands, then we can conclude that the data are roughly normal. I'll go ahead and turn that off. And let me minimize some of these guys. There we go, so they don't take up as much real estate. To perform a hypothesis test, I can perform a test on a mean or on a standard deviation. I'll go ahead and select test mean. And this will perform either a t-test, a z-test if I enter a standard deviation, or a non-parametric test. So let me pick a value that's on the outer bounds of our confidence interval. And I think our confidence interval was, let me hit cancel here and open this back up again. Um, let, let's say that we, we like to um, uh, be at 250 particles. So we want to test the hypothesis that these cleaning strategies are allowing us to hit our target of 250 particles. So I'll select test mean, and I'll plug in the hypothesized value. Again, if I'd like to do a non-parametric test, the non-parametric tests are always grouped wherever we see the corresponding parametric test. I'll click OK. And any time you perform a hypothesis test and jump, you're going to see some, some new output on the side. And p-values are represented as the prob greater than something. And in this case, our reference distribution is the student's t distribution. So where you see the prob greater than the absolute value of t, this is the p-value corresponding to the two-tailed test. So our actual value for the mean was 301. Our hypothesized value is 250. So we see the test statistic that's produced, and we see p-values corresponding to the two-tailed test, and also for the corresponding one-tailed test. The curve that we see at the bottom is there to help us interpret the test results. So the curve is centered at the hypothesized value and represents the distribution of sample means we would observe in repeated sampling for the given sample size. The red line is drawn at our observed sample mean. So it gives an indication of how far our observed mean is from the hypothesized value. And the area in the tails beyond our observed mean represents the p-value. And if you're new to p-values and hypothesis testing, under the red triangle next to test mean is a p-value animator. And this p-value animator shows us the same information, but allows us to increase or decrease the difference between our hypothesized value and our observed value to see what happens to the t-ratio and the p-value. So if you're teaching statistics, this is a really nice teaching tool. Or if you're a student just getting your hands around p-values, uh, it's a really useful tool to explore these concepts. Uh, one other thing you can do from here is under sample size, you can do some sort of ad hoc exploration of power. So what if I had 100 observations instead of 18? Or what if I only had 10? How does this impact my test? So I'll go ahead and close this. Um, and one of the tests that I'd like to show while I'm in the distribution platform uh, is a rel relatively new test and jump called test equivalence. 
And what test equivalence does is it allows you to enter your target, but it also lets you put in a difference that if your difference between what you've observed and your hypothesized value is less than that number of units, then JUMP will consider them practically equivalent. So if I click OK here, the JUMP is actually performing two different tests. So it's performing two different one-tail tests. It's producing a 95% confidence interval. And we see the shaded region is our target plus or minus the number of units we specified. And if these don't overlap, then we can call them different. If they do overlap, then we can consider them to be practically equivalent. And again, that option was test equivalence. Let's move on now. Actually, I wanted to do one more thing while I was there, uh, and that is fitting distributions. I closed that a little too quickly there. Uh, if I'm interested in exploring the shape of this distribution, under the red triangle, down towards the bottom is continuous fit. So I can fit a normal distribution or a specified distribution. I can also ask jump to fit different distributions and compare these distributions and select the best fit. So if I select all, jump is testing all of these distributions. It'll be testing all the distributions. And then it'll compare all of those distributions uh, and tell us which, which fit is the best. And it seems to have uh, locked up. There it goes. All right. I was a little too impatient there. Um, so Jump is telling us that the best distribution is the Weibel distribution. And it's using this AIC corrected uh, statistic uh, to, to give us information on which is the best distribution. Um, in fact, the, the Weibel and the normal are only different by about 0.75 on the AICC range. Um, so these are actually two distributions that JUMP would consider to be very similar in terms of fit. So in this case, I would probably select the normal distribution um, since it's not really far, far off from the Weibel in terms of the fit. And we'll return to different tools for testing different distributions uh, in just a few moments. Now, what if I'd like to, to look at one variable against another variable? In this case, I'm going to use fit y by x. And fit y by x is a really nice reversible platform for looking at data that uh, has different coding. So if I'm interested in looking at coal particles, for example, and the relationship between coal particles and pH, this little key in the corner tells us what type of analysis we'll get based on the, the modeling type for the variables that we've selected. So the icon corresponds to uh, the variables. So on the side, this corresponds to the modeling type for our y variable that we've selected. And across the bottom, it corresponds to the modeling type for the x variable that we've selected. So here we've, we've got a continuous y and a continuous x. So jump will take us to the bivariate fit. And notice that this little graph icon looks like we're fitting a line through points. So that's exactly what we'll do. If I also select polymer, Jump's going to do the combination of both coal particles and pH and coal particles and polymer. So in this case, I've got a categorical X. So Jump will take us to the one-way platform. And notice the little graph icon looks like box, box plot. So we're fun, fundamentally interested in comparing the different groups. Um, we won't talk about this in this workshop, but if we're across the bottom here, we've got a categorical Y. We can do a logistic regression, ordinal logistic regression, or multinomial. And we can also do contingency tables and chi-square tests. So I'll go ahead and click OK. And as always, there are additional options under the red triangle. So under the red triangle next to bivariate fit, we can fit the mean, fit the line. We can fit polynomial or other types of fits. Um, fit special is, is um, if I want to do a transformation of the x or the y. Uh, fit flexible allows us to explore um, splines. Um, and as we go down through the list, you see there are a number of different options here. Um, I'll start by asking for density ellipse. And this is where you get uh, correlations in jump if you're just looking at two variables. So if I select density ellipse 0.95, this draws an ellipse that helps us get a visual representation of the nature of the association between the two variables. And if I click and open this little outline view below, it gives us the, the calculated correlation and also a p-value for that correlation. Now, if, if you have a number of different variables that you're looking at and you want to explore correlations, under Analyze, Multivariate, the option to use is Multivariate. Now, for anything that you fit, 
below the graph, you'll see that there's a red icon with additional options. So for example, I might choose to shade this or select points that are inside or outside. In this case, I'm simply going to remove this fit. And, and I'll fit a line. So when you fit a line and jump, below the graph, you'll see new output. So we see the fitted equation for the line. We see a summary of fit with R squared and R squared adjusted, root mean square error, and ANOVA table, given the overall test for significance of the model. And then under the parameter estimates table, we see the estimates. So these are the coefficients that are in the linear model. And anytime you see a parameter estimates table in jump, I'll tuck some of this stuff away. If you'd like to ask for additional information, for example, maybe the confidence interval for the coefficients, if you right click on that table and ask for columns, you can ask for lower and 95% uh, interval. So this is the confidence interval for the coefficient. And if you're in a multiple regression situation, uh, you can ask for VIFs to, to allow you to assess multicollinearity. Now I fit a line here. When you fit a line, again, you get an option below the graph. And several different options are provided. Uh, one of the first things I typically look at is plot residuals. So plot residuals produces a number of different residuals to help us assess whether a linear model makes sense. We can fit confidence curves for the mean or for the individual points. We can shade those intervals. So again, additional options are always available under the red triangle for whatever we have fit. If we'd like to save the formula out to the data table, uh, if I select Save Predicted, this saves the model out to the data table. Now for the one-way case, we see completely different options. So here we're looking at different polymers, and we're interested in exploring whether there are differences between these polymers. So under the red triangle, we see things like quantiles, which fits box plots and produces quantiles, means ANOVA for officially comparing the groups. Uh, and again, anytime you see diamonds and jump, these are confidence intervals for the mean. And we're fundamentally asking whether these intervals overlap. So down below, we see the ANOVA uh, table. We see the summary of fit, the ANOVA table, and the means for the individual groups. Additional options from here, and I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, there's a new analysis of means method, uh, which is a different approach to comparing means. If you want to be able to isolate out which means are significantly different from other means, we use options in a compare means. Several different non-parametric non procedures are available normal quantile plots, CDF plot, and additional graphical options are available under display options. So I'll move on from here. So we saw distribution for one variable at a time, fit y by x for two variables at a time. Let's talk about building statistical models. So I'd like to be able to build a statistical model. There are different types of models we can build. We can build linear models, nonlinear models, and Jump also has nice built-in tools for reliability and survival. So let's start with looking at fitting models, fitting linear models. And I'll open a data set called CAR Physical Data. Again, this is another sample data set. And here I'm fundamentally interested in horsepower as a function of a lot of different variables. So I've got the country, and this is information on different cars uh, that were sold in the US at some point in time. Um, so I've got country, type, the weight of the car, the turning circle, displacement is engine side. And let, let's say that we'd like to build a linear model to break horsepower, horsepower as a function of some of these other variables. Anytime we fit linear models in jump, where we have multiple axes, we use analyze and then fit model. And in fit model, we specify whatever our, our y or response or dependent variable is. So here it's horsepower. And then under model effects, we specify our x's or our factors. Here I've got country. And a country actually has three levels. Um, in jump, you don't have to dummy code or create indicator variables. Um, jump will actually do that behind the scenes. So I'll add country. I'll add type. In fact, I'll go ahead and select all of these other variables. So here I've got my main effects. Now if I want to add interactions, so let's say I want to add interactions between these three variables, I can add a full factorial. So I can add all possible interactions. In fact, this is the same platform we'll use to analyze design experiments. Uh, so let's say I'd like to just add in all possible two-way interactions between these three variables. Degree is set to two, and this means that if I select factorial to degree, 
it'll add in all possible two-way interactions between those variables. If you know that you just have two variables that you'd like to add the interaction for, so for example, turning circle and gas tank size, you can select those variables and then hit the cross key and it'll hit in those specified um, interactions. So from this platform, this is, this is probably the most versatile and flexible platform in all of JUMP. Under personality, the default is standard least squares or ordinary least squares regression. And this is because I specified a continuous response variable. Under the red triangle, you can see that there's stepwise. So this is for model selection and model reduction. Um, generalized regression, if you have Jump Pro, this allows you to fit models to non-normal responses. It also allows you to, um, to use penalized regression tools like lasso and elastic net and ridge regression. Um, if you've got a design, a split plot design, or a design where you've got a nested sort of structure, um, you can fit it as a mixed model. And again, in Jump Pro, you have some additional options for fitting uh, mixed models with different covariance structures. Um, we'll see in a few moments proportional hazards or parametric survival if you're dealing with reliability or survival data, uh, and a lot of different options available. So I'll simply click Run. And at the top, we see an actual by predicted plot. And this is kind of like a residual plot. What we're looking at is these bands are confidence bands. The tighter the points are to the line, uh, the less unexplained variation we have in our model. The blue line is fit at the overall average of our data. And you see some summary statistics below this picture. So this is giving us an indication of the overall fit of our model and how significant our model is. There's an effect summary table that sorts our terms in our model uh, by p-value, a residual plot, and several different plots are available. So if we start looking at this, um, if I'd like to reduce or simplify this model, we've actually added some interactions to the model. So these little carrots are indicating we don't want to remove this term from the model because it's involved in an interaction that's still in the model. So we can use this little panel to slowly reduce our model. So if I select a variable, I'm going to select this interaction and click Remove. And again, we'll do, use the same strategy when we're building models for um, design experimental situations. Um, I'll slowly remove terms from the model. And at this point, it's indicating that everything else is involved in an interaction. So this is as far as I could go. Now, if I want to visualize this model, in fact, I'll tuck some of these things away. At the bottom, by default, we see a profiler. And this profiler is also available under factor profiling, along with a lot of other visualization tools. So what the profiler allows us to do, if I open up this parameter estimates table, is we've just built a linear model. And what the profiler allows us to do is visualize our coefficients and also explore what happens if we change values of the different predictors. So for example, if I look at weight, the, the slope for weight is increasing. And this indicates that my response on average increases as I increase weight, holding everything else constant. So on the side, we see the predicted value for my response confidence interval for that response. And if I drag weight, and I'm just going to drag this vertical line to the low end, we see the changes in the predicted horsepower. Now, because I've got interactions in the model, notice the slopes of the lines in the other panels also change. So there's an interaction between weight and type of car. If I do the same thing for displacement, keep an eye on the slope for country at the very beginning here as a change displacement from the low level to the high level. It actually doesn't change that much. So this is a really nice way of exploring uh, interactions. And from this panel, it's got a built-in optimizer. So I can optimize this to find uh, settings for my Xs that allow me to hit a certain target. And there's also a built-in Monte Carlo simulator. So we did that relatively quickly. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going, and let's talk a little bit about fitting nonlinear models. So JUMP has a really nice um, facility for fitting nonlinear models. And under Analyze, we see two options under Specialized Modeling, Fit Curve and Nonlinear. So what Fit Curve does is allows us to fit um, several um, previously defined nonlinear models to our data and explore these models. Nonlinear also allows us to, to, to use this fit curve capacity, um, but will allow us to select a model from a, a rich model library 
or to use a formula that we've created ourselves. So let's take a quick look at this. So I'm going to open up U.S. population. And this is a data set where we've got this variable population. We're looking at population growth over time, and we know that's not, not linear. Now, this, is, this particular data set has a formula that's been created. Um, you can write your own custom formulas just by adding a new column and access the formula editor. And in this particular case, we've written a formula, and we've defined different parameters. So if I use this in the nonlinear platform, it'll allow me to find optimal values for, of, for beta 1 and beta 2, or beta naught and beta 1, um, using these values as the starting values. But let's just take a look at this using fit curve for now. So I'll go to specialized modeling, fit curve. I'll select population as my Y, year as my X, and click OK. So from here under fit curve, I can ask for a number of different types of curves. And as I select a curve, it fits the curve and produces a number of statistics down below. So it shows me what the prediction model is. Also shows me the parameter estimates. And then under the red triangle are a number of different options. If I want to compare this fit to other fits, under the red triangle, I can select another fit. So for example, I'll fit a logistic uh, four P or four parameter model. And it overlays that model on top of the existing model. The model comparison platform allows us to compare those two models that we fit. And the AIC weight is essentially saying, assuming that one of these two models is the correct model, what's the probability that the correct model is quadratic or logistic? And in this case, it's saying that the quadratic is a much better fit. So that's using uh, fit curve. Now, if I use a nonlinear platform, I've got the option. I can set it up the exact same way, where I've got population as a function of year. And this will give me the same options. Or I can use that formula that I previously defined. And if I use the formula that I previously defined, it uses those starting values and allows me to find optimal values using the model that I've specified. Or I can use the nonlinear model library. So there are a number of different models that are built in here to give us starting points. And we can, if I select a model, for example, uh, we can see this graph and we can see the parameters in the model and then we can specify starting values for those different parameters. So very quick tour of nonlinear. Um, and very quickly, um, reliability and survival, just so you can see what's available here under Analyze, Reliability and Survival. If I'm fitting a model to data that is fundamentally um, uh, time to failure or time to event data, I'll use one of the options under Reliability and Survival. So life distribution is sort of like the distribution platform where I'm dealing with, with one variable at a time. I fit life by x. I'm adding a, a second factor. Um, as we scroll through, we see there are several different uh, tools for looking at reliability um, and then survival. And then we can also fit different models. So I'll show you very quickly. Let me open up a data set, life distribution. And this is a data set, again, from the sample data directory. And here I'm looking at time to execute a job. Now, if I'm just interested in looking at this variable, I'll use life distribution. But I can also fit a model. So I'll start simple and just use life distribution. And life distribution allows me to specify um, censoring. So if I've got a sensor column, um, the type of sensor code, I can add a failure cause. I can also compare groups. And we'll simply select execute time as the response and click OK. So by default, we get the non-parametric Kaplan-Meier curve. And what this allows us to do is explore different curves. For example, if I want to explore a log normal fit to this, clicking on the scale option will apply that scale to the data. So it's like looking at a normal quantile plot. I'm fundamentally interested in if I apply a certain distribution, does this plot straighten out? It looks like log normal does a pretty good job. And by selecting the dog normal, I also see this distribution profiler. So this allows me to see what happens to execute time, actually to the probability, as I change the execute time. Below, we see a number of additional options that are available for exploring the data. Uh, if I'd like to be able to, to use some built-in tools uh, to, to allow me to pick the best distribution, in this case, I'll select fit all non-negative. And like we saw before, jump will fit all the different distributions and it'll give us a comparison of those available distributions. So in this case, it says the best distribution is for Shea. And other similar models are generalized gamma, 
and the log logistics. So that's life distribution. And again, if you want to fit a model or do more um, uh, complicated work, then we can use some of the other options that are here. So let's get into the design of experiments. So I'm going to try to spend the bulk of the rest of the time here on design experiments. So the DOE menu in JUMP allows us to design and evaluate a variety of different types of experiments. You'll see all of the classical designs under the classical option. So this is the screening design, so fractional factorials in Plackett-Berman. You'll see response service designs, uh, full factorial mixture designs in Taguchi arrays. In JUMP, there's a nice custom design platform. And what this allows you to do is, instead of selecting a, a textbook design, you can design an experiment that meets your needs. So if you have um, constraints or you have a limitation in the number of runs or you, if you have certain interactions or quadratic terms that you know you need to be able to estimate, the custom design platform gives you a really nice, flexible interface for doing that. Augment design allows you to, um, if you've done a screening design, allows you to add additional runs to this design. Or if you're doing sequential experimentation, allows you to start with a small uh, factorial design and then add axial runs or center points to that design. Design diagnostics. Um, so this allows you to evaluate a previously generated design or compare competing designs. So you may have um, several different designs that you're considering, and you want to look at these designs for different um, uh, different criteria. So maybe the, the power or uh, the prediction variance. So uh, there may be different criteria for selecting design, and this allows you to easily compare those different designs. And this is also where you find the sample size and power calculator. So this gives you uh, options to calculate sample size needed for given uh, different types of hypothesis tests. So let's take a look at an example experiment. And this is, again, from the sample data directory. And the data set, uh, it's reactor 32 runs. Um, this is an experiment involving five factors, each at two levels, and our response is percent reacted. So by default, when you design an experiment and jump, you'll see this pattern column show up, and the pattern just tells you whether the variable is set at the high level or the low level. You'll also see a column, and this column will be blank when we first generate it and jump, and then you'll see some additional options on the side for going back and coming up with different designs. So this is a two to the fifth full factorial experiment. And how would I design this jump? If I know that I want a full factorial, I'll use classical and then full factorial design. Each of these factors is continuous. So I'll add five here under add n factors, continuous to level. We note that you can also add categorical variables here. If you click on any one of these labels, you can double click and change the name. And I won't do that here. You can set different response goals. You can also set upper and lower limits. So we may, for example, want the lower limit for percent reactor to be 95%. You can also specify the values for the different variables. I'll click Continue. And Jump tells us this is going to create a 2 to the 5th full factorial. By default, it's going to be completely random in the order. And we can also add center points and repli replicates here. And a replicate in this case indicates it's going to replicate the entire design. So when I select Make Table, this is generating a full 2 to the 5th factorial design where the last column Y is blank. So we would use this as our design table and enter values of our response variable uh, as we run each of the individual trials. Now an alternative to this is to use instead of using full factorial, is to use custom design. So I'll add five factors here, and then continuous. I'm doing basically the same thing at this point. So it looks the same so far. I can specify the response goal, and again, I can specify the limits here, put in 95 here, and I'll click continue. But this is where it's different. So from here, I can find factor constraints. So I may have linear constraints. There may be combinations that just aren't feasible. So I can specify um, different types of constraints or disallowed combinations or things that I just don't want it to make possible in my design. If I select interactions second, this will add all possible two-way interactions. 
From here, I can specify response surface design. I can add in particular cross terms or particular powers. So if I specify second, jump adds in all possible two-way interactions. And note that at the bottom, jump is keeping track of the number of runs required. I can add in additional individual replicate runs. So for example, maybe I want to add in two extra runs here. And jump keeps track of the number of runs. So by default, if I select make design, jump is going to generate a 24 run design. So this is substantially smaller than the 32 run design that I fit um, with uh, 32 runs. So you can, you can really create efficient designs that take advantage of your limited capacity or limited resources. Um, what else can I do from here? From here, I can generate split plot designs, mixture designs. So there's a variety of different design types that I can generate from here. And under custom design at the top, there are also different types of optimality criteria that I can set. So I'll simply select make design here. And anytime you make a design and jump, um, in this case, since I'm using the customer designer, there's no one um, correct design. There are all sorts of different possible designs. And Jump tries to find a design that meets your criteria. And you'll see, see this little design evaluation option. This gives you the ability to take a look at your design from the perspective of power and the variance in your, um, your prediction, the variance as, as a fraction of your design space, so there are a variety of different criteria that you can use for selecting this design. So if you'd like to be able to minimize the, the variance in your uh, estimates of your coefficients or certain uh, designs you might want to select, uh, you may want to add additional runs. Uh, but you'll see all this information here to be able to, to guide you in terms of picking the best design under design evaluation. So let me close this. Um, and let's take, let's take a look at analysis. And I've got a 20, 20 run design that I've generated earlier. To analyze this design quickly under analyze fit model, this looks a lot like what we did earlier. And if I hit run here, notice that this it's the same exact platform for analyzing the design. Again, I'll use the same features for reducing this design. Okay, So same options that we saw earlier. Um, and let's take a look at design evaluation. So a new feature in um, Jump 13 is the ability to compare competing designs. So I've got these two designs. Over. I've got a custom design with 20 runs, or I've got the full factorial with 32 runs. We may want to be able to compare these to see if we lose a lot of information by having a design that's 12 runs smaller than the full factorial. So here I would use design diagnostic, compare design, I'm going to look at this reactor 20 run design versus the 32 run design. I've got the same five factors in both. So I'm going to match on those two columns and click OK. And if I scroll down, it's basically allowing me to take a look at how these two different designs compare. So I've obviously got a little bit more power with the 32 run design. We can look at the, the prediction variance. So there's a little bit more variance on the bounds of our design space for the, the smaller design. So there's a trade-off. But compare designs allows us to, to look at these designs and balance the trade-offs for having a smaller, much more efficient. And the last couple of things I want to talk about um, is design tools or quality tools. Um, there are a lot of tools um, that are kind of standard quality improvement or quality control tools. So statistical process control, um, all of the standard control charts are built in. Um, there's also a really nice platform for dynamic control charting. So all of our quality tools are grouped under Analyze, Quality, and Process. If you're looking for a standard control chart, you'll see it listed under Control Chart. Um, I generally will use the Control Chart Builder which is like the graph builder, but allows you to drag and drop, and it automatically produces a control chart. So on the side, we see uh, the summaries for um, the individual and moving range chart. You can right click and change the chart to a different type. If I drag date now into the bottom panel, the default, if I hit undo, was an IR chart. But now if I want an X bar, an R chart, I simply drag day on, and now it's automatically subgrouping by day. So each one of these points in the top chart is an average of several observations. Now, if I want to break this down by some other variable, like I did in the, in the graph builder to start with, 
I can drag that other variable to a face zone, and now it's producing control limits for each of the different phases. So a super dynamic and interactive platform for creating the standard control charts. And from here, you can produce the Shewhart charts um, for both variables and attributes data, but you can also produce charts for uh, rare events. And I'm doing this rather quickly because we're almost out of time. Uh, if you're doing process capability studies in JUMP, you can um, use the distribution platform. Uh, the distribution platform allows you to fit capability studies for uh, continuous data or also non-normal data. So if I click on the red triangle, you see an option, capability analysis. Um, so under normal, you'll see that there are different dis distributions that we can fit here. I'll go ahead and plug in some values so you can see what this looks like. So I'll say my target is, is 15. So if I, if I simply select long-term sigma, then this is going to give me uh, PP and PPK. Um, if I do short-term, it'll give me both CP and PP measures. So I'll click OK here. Um, now, by default, it doesn't give us the capability labeling, the PPK capability labeling, but this is something that you can set in the preference. But by default, we're going to see a summary of the overall capability along with some other measures. Now, if we're dealing with data that's measured over time, and this sample data is actually measured over time, we can use the control chart platform. And if we're dealing with measures where, for example, we might have a process where we've got several measures and we'd like to, to monitor uh, all of those measures or produce um, capability metrics for several measures, um, there are two different platforms in JUMP, and these are under screening. So if, I, if I'm interested in, um, in trying to monitor um, and use control charts to monitor several variables at a time, I'll use this process screening. So this produces control charts for several different variables. If I'd like to be able to assess the capability for several different variables, then I'll use this process, process capability option. Uh, and the last topic, which we won't really have a chance to get to, is measurement uh, studies uh, and cap measurement capability studies. And there are two options under quality and process. Uh, measurement systems analysis, this is going to use the Wheeler's EMP or Wheeler's uh, Evaluate Measurement Process Approach. And if you select an option under variability attribute gauge chart, this will do the standard gauge r and r or attribute studies. So with that, uh, I think I'm out of time. So we talked about using uh, different tools for summarizing and graphing data, like the columns viewer, and distribution, and tabulate, the graph builder for producing graphical summaries of our data. Uh, we talked about different types of statistical intervals, a hypothesis test from the distribution platform or from FIT Y by X, different ways of producing statistical models, so FIT model for producing linear models, nonlinear for producing nonlinear models, and we briefly touched on survival and reliability. Uh, we briefly talked about how to design experiments in JUMP and how to analyze those experiments and some quality tools. Uh, and again, the JUMP help in the books, under help books, um, you'll find a lot of rich details that go much further into each of these methods that we introduced. Uh, so with that, I think I'm out of time, and I'll stop and turn this over to uh, to Ruth.